everyone. And welcome to It Takes Guts to Improve Your Health. Dr. Alan Desmond is a consultant gastroenterologist based in Dublin, England, board certified in both gastroenterology and general intern medicine. He completed his specialist training in Cork, Dublin, and Oxford. Dr. Desmond is a hospital is the hospital's clinical lead for the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease, a topic on which he has published numerous research papers. Dr. Desmond actively promotes a whole food plant-based diet, yay, particularly for his patients with chronic digestive disorders. He is a founding advisory board member of the Plant-Based Professionals UK and is currently engaged in clinical research evaluating a whole food plant-based diet uh, or dietary intervention as a treatment for patients with Crohn's disease. He is the author of the best-selling book, a plant-based diet revolution, 28 days to a healthier gut and a healthier you. And um, by the way, that book is available at the Winter Haven Library if you would like to check it out. Okay, so Dr. Desmond, it is a pleasure to have you coming all the way across the pond and joining us here in Polk County. Welcome to Polk Wellness Professionals and Chat and Chew. Hey, thanks so much, Debbie. Thanks for inviting me. And as we were just saying a moment ago, what an honor to be invited to present to you all and to follow in the footsteps of my friends, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn Jr. and Dr. Kim Williams. Um, so hopefully I can live up to those wonderful speakers. Um, so thank you very much. And I can see you all like you're in the room with me. It's, it's fantastic. So thank you very much. I'm going to speak to a topic that should concern everybody. So bowel cancer risk diet and the gut microbiome. What should we as health professionals tell our patients about their risk and what they can do to reduce the risk? And what, what should we know as individuals? Um, I'm sure there's plenty of people in this virtual room right now who have lost friends or loved ones to uh, bowel cancer, colon cancer. And if there are any fellow clinicians in the room or GPs or primary care providers, they will have lost patients to this disease. So is there anything we can do? You know, what's the role of food? What's the role of the gut microbiome in this very common cancer? So just first of all, just to, just to discuss what, uh, this main headline. So if you don't remember anything else from this conversation today, I'm going to give you two slides to remember. This is the first slide. The standard Western diet sets us up for standard Western diseases. So just remember that one. And then there's one at the end you can remember. And in between, we'll do a whole bunch of other science and stuff, okay? So what is bowel cancer? Well, I'm a gastroenterologist. I do screening colonoscopies for patients. And sadly, more than once per week, sometimes two or three times per week, I will need to sit down with a patient on whom I've just done a colonoscopy and explain to them that I have just diagnosed them with bowel cancer. It's a conversation that nobody wants to have, but it's a conversation that over 1 million people around the globe have with their healthcare provider every single year. And this is a life changing diagnosis. Overall, the five-year survival rate with colon cancer is only 63%. Now, if we can catch it early and diagnose it as an, at an early stage, like we hope to do as screening colonoscopists, the survival rate is much, much better. The survival rate is as high as 90%. But even so, it's still a life-changing diagnosis because even someone diagnosed with an early stage cancer has still been diagnosed with cancer and may still be looking at surgery or even chemotherapy. Bowel cancer, so we're talking about cancer arising from the lining of the large bowel or colon. This cartoon just shows you what your colon looks like inside your body. Um, it has a lot of functions. I guess its most basic function is making poop and the poop leaves via the bottom end here. And when I do a colonoscopy and I'm looking at the lining of the bowel, the healthy lining of the bowel looks kind of like pink, uh, kind of like the inside of your cheek. Um, and the picture there shows this little lump. That's a cancerous polyp. That's what we don't want to see. But sadly in my practice, it's something I will see several times per week. In the United States, this is the third most common cancer diagnosed in both men and women. You guys have 150,000 new diagnoses and 53,000 deaths per year. 
for females living in the US, their lifetime risk of bowel cancer is about one in 25. And it's the second leading cause of death due to cancer in the United States. So in short, everybody needs to know about this. Now, bowel cancer is so common in the UK where I live and work that we have public awareness campaigns. We have a bowel cancer screening program where we get people to check their poo for any blood loss or abnormal DNA. And we tell them this little kit could save your life. Bowel cancer is so common that we have posters like that one on the right hand side, which are in public toilets. And we tell people if they've seen blood in their poop or if they've had looser poop, they need to go and see their doctor because it could be bowel cancer. And when you live in a country like the US or the UK where bowel cancer is so common, then it could be true. If you see a little bit of blood in your poop and you're particularly in patients over the age of 40, there's a reasonable chance there might be bowel cancer and you need to get checked out. Now, we have seen worrying trends in high income countries regarding bowel cancer in the last 20 to 30 years. We've been doing a pretty good job of screening patients in, you know, from the age of 50, 60, 70. And we've sort of prevented increases in bowel cancer rates in that age group. But what we've been seeing here in Europe is we've been seeing our patients getting younger. We've seen bowel cancer rates in young people aged even between 20 and 39 increasing year on year. We've seen a similar pattern in the United States. Colon cancer, when I was in medical school 20 years ago, this was something that you, dis that you, that you diagnosed in older folks, which is still true. But in the US right now, one in eight cases of bowel cancer are diagnosed in a patient aged less than 50. This is a disease that we're seeing in more and more in young people. And we are seeing this in our clinical practice. I've personally been involved in several cases in the last few months of people who would generally be regarded as too young for bowel cancer. And of course, the loss of Hollywood actor uh, Chadwick Boseman uh, in 2020 highlighted this, having been, he was diagnosed, unfortunately, with stage three colorectal cancer at just age 39 and passed away at the age of 43. We've also been, we've also seen changes uh, globally. We're seeing worrying trends globally in bowel cancer because what we're seeing is that as countries westernize or modernize or industrialize their food and their lifestyle, we're seeing rates of bowel cancer increase globally. Um, if you live in a country that eats a standard American, standard Western diet, your risk, lifetime risk of developing bowel cancer may be more than 10 times higher than someone who lives in an unindustrialized country, such as South Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa. And as those countries embrace a more Americanized or industrialized approach to food and life, we're seeing increased rates in those countries. And it's expected that by, you know, within the next few years, we'll be having rather than 1 million cases of bowel cancer per year globally will have far more than that. In fact, we will expect to be getting more than 2 million cases per year and over a million people dying from colon cancer globally. And on the ground, I mean, for, for different countries, this is visible right now. I, I recently spoke at a conference in, in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. And what they have seen, that's a country that is industrializing and westernizing very quickly. And they are seeing increased rates of obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, diverticular disease, gastroesophageal reflux disease, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis. And yes, they're seeing increasing rates of bowel cancer. This graph here shows that the bowel cancer statistics are going up, particularly in the industrial centers, year on year, more and more bowel cancer. Why is this? Why have we got so much bowel cancer in the US and the UK? Why are these newly modernized or industrialized countries seeing more and more bowel cancer? Why is this? And what can we do about it? And it's important to know this because every single person in this picture represents 3,000 people in the United States who will be diagnosed with bowel cancer in the next 12 months. This is an evidence-based statement. The majority of bowel cancer cases can be prevented by a healthy diet and lifestyle. And I'm gonna show you why. When we talk about evidence, strength of medical evidence, we have a pyramid of evidence. The strongest medical evidence comes 
results from meta-analyses and systematic reviews. And most of the data I'm going to show you today is from that part of the pyramid. Although occasionally we will dip down into cohort studies, case control studies, and cross-sectional studies. We, we're going to start off by looking at the strongest possible evidence on food, lifestyle, and bowel cancer. So Debbie already tipped you off that I'm an advocate of a healthy, whole food, plant-based diet, just like Dr. Williams and Dr. Esselstyn, of course. So let's talk about fiber, the structural carbohydrate that you can only get in your diet by eating plant foods. So when we look at the strongest level of medical evidence, five meta-analyses conducted over 28 period, we find that the people who eat the most fiber can reduce their risk of bowel cancer by up to 24%. No surprise, more fiber means more plants, more phytonutrients, more antioxidants. And in fact, eating more plants seems to be incredibly powerful. Every 10 grams of whole grain fiber consumed per day, reducing the risk by up to 17%. Conclusion, dietary fiber is protective, reducing our risk of developing bowel cancer. What about my shopping basket here? So this is what my shopping basket will look like later on the way home, filled with fruits and vegetables and legumes. Well, fruits and vegetables and legumes are protective. Nine huge meta-analyses published over a 27-year period looking at fruits, vegetables, and legumes. Why would you look at these foods in terms of bowel cancer uh, prevention? Well, fruits, veggies, and legumes are great sources of healthy plant-based protein, vitamin E, vitamin B, selenium, lignans. All of these things have potential cancer protective um, properties. And the evidence says yes. People who eat much more fruits, vegetables, and legumes particularly vegetables and their neighbors in high income countries may reduce their risk by up to 52%. High consumers of legumes, such as your beans and lentils, uh, cabbage and cruciferous veggies, reducing their risk by up to 24%. And again, just like whole grain fiber, we see a beneficial dose response curve. So the more we eat, the lower the risk. For every 200 grams of fruits and vegetables daily, the risk being reduced by 22%. Think about that, just 200 grams of fruit. Now, I know you guys don't have the metric system, so you're probably wondering, what does 200 grams of fruit look like? It looks like this, an apple. An apple a day to keep the oncologist away. That's powerful medicine. What about everybody's favorite bean, the soya bean? Well, soya beans are just like beans. They have all the other protective effects that we mentioned about beans earlier, but they also contain other beneficial substances called isoflavones, which could impact cancer initiation and progression through multiple pathways. And when we look at the big data from the US, Europe, and Japan, we find that yes, people who eat soya beans, edamame beans, soya milk, tofu, tempeh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they may reduce their risk of developing colorectal cancer by up to 27%. The EPIC study is a huge European endeavor looking at risk factors for cancer. The European pros prospective inquiry into cancer a few years ago, they published data on 10 European countries, having followed up the equivalent of 1.9 million people for years. And they concluded, as you'd expect from everything I just showed you, fruits, vegetables, legumes, right? Fiber intake reduces your risk of, of uh, colon cancer. Eating plants reduces your risk of bowel cancer. And the people who eat the most in high income countries, which still isn't an awful lot, Debbie, you probably eat a lot of fiber for breakfast, um, but you know, the people who eat the most fiber, even in these low income countries, may reduce their risk by up to 42%, which is dramatic. And in populations with low fiber intake, and in Europe, that often means, you know, 10 or 20 grams per day. If we could just get them to double up to 20 or 40 grams, or 20 or 30 grams of fiber per day, we could reduce the burden of colorectal cancer by up to 40%. 
So here's a question that I get asked a lot as a gastroenterologist who promotes the benefits of a whole food plant-based diet that doesn't contain any animal products. Are dairy foods protective against bowel cancer? Well, when we look at evidence from the United States and Europe predominantly, um, where uh, they've looked at the rates of bowel cancer and dairy consumption, we do find that milk seems to protect people from getting bowel cancer. Uh, cheese, no, yogurt, no, but milk consumption. The benefits are shown that for every 400 grams per day of milk, the, result, the, reduce, the risk of colon cancer can be reduced by up to 26%. But there's a lot of caveats here. Let me explain. Calcium. In high income countries where the diet is generally poor and we don't get a lot of leafy greens and fruits and vegetables and whole grains, where those foods account for only 9% of dietary intakes, people get most of their dietary calcium from dairy products. And if you increase your dietary calcium, you can reduce your risk of bowel cancer because the calcium actually acts to neutralize some of the pro-cancerous effects of a standard Western diet. So in my practice, I advise people to reduce their risk of bowel cancer by increasing their calcium and their fiber and their legumes at the same time by eating beans, greens, dates, calcium, set, tofu, et cetera. So they get this triple hit of anti-cancer effect. I'm also concerned that consumption of dairy products shouldn't be recommended in this situation because the consumption of dairy may increase one's risk of breast cancer, prostate cancer, and other cancers. And I'm not the only person who thinks this. The World Cancer Research Fund, I highly recommend looking at their website, wcrf.org, are a global academic partnership who look at things we can do with our diet and lifestyle to reduce our risk of all cancers. And although they recognize this data on dairy and bowel cancer, they state on their patient information leaflets, because we are unsure about the effect on other cancers, we don't make any recommendations about dairy products. They do not recommend consuming dairy to reduce your overall cancer risk. So let's leave dairy and head over to fish and omega-3 oils. Well, when we look at the evidence, although a lot of people put forward that fish might help to keep your gut healthy and reduce your risk of bowel cancer, the big data says no. There is no convincing evidence showing us that uh, eating fish reduces or increases your risk of developing bowel cancer. At best case scenario, it does nothing in either direction. Um, here in the UK, we had a huge randomized control trial that ran for uh, five years uh, back in the halfway through the last decade, where we took people who were getting bowel cancer screening and we randomized them to get high dose fish oil to see if we could prevent more precancerous polyps from happening. Didn't work. Fish oils don't work. Eating fish doesn't help to reduce your risk. And there's a big long list of all these other supplements and things that you can take to try and reduce your risk and they don't seem to work. And often what we see here is that these are studies where we've taken like an isolated beneficial substance that we know is in plants like vitamin E or vitamin C or beta carotene or selenium. And we've extracted that and a study to see if we can get the same benefit by just putting in a pill and the results tell us, no, we can't get the same results by putting these beneficial substances in a pill. We need to eat the whole plant. So there are only two dietary components that increase your risk of getting this common cancer. They're both in this picture. I'm going to give you a minute to figure it out. Okay. I'm going to give you a clue. It's not the tomato. <laughs> alcohol, sadly. Uh, alcohol increases the risk of developing bowel cancer. Even one drink per day increasing the risk by up to 13%. And people who drink more than four drinks per day may increase their risk by 58%. No surprise, alcohol, ethanol is directly carcinogenic on the human body. It's been linked to about 13 different cancers, uh, most notably uh, breast cancer in females. And the increased risk of bowel cancer alcohol consumption affects to be, uh, affect males more than females, with, which is what this gentleman just found out here. So he's decided not to drink that beer. So apart from alcohol, the only food, the only dietary component 
that is shown time and time again to increase the risk of bowel cancer is meat. And again, we see a dose effect relationship, but this time it's a harmful dose effect relationship because the more you eat, the higher your risk. Not like the fruit and veggies where the risk went down with meat, it goes up. So for every 100 grams per day of total or red meat consumption, we see an increase of up to 30%. And this phrase, no clear limit threshold identifiable means that we don't know if it gets safer and safer and safer when you get down to zero. We have no convincing evidence to tell us that 10 grams a day is safer than no grams per day or 20 grams per day. Um, it seems that even eating small amounts may be harmful. But of course, this shouldn't surprise us. Uh, back in 2015, the International Agency for Research and Carcinogens, this is an international group which functions under the World Health Organization. It's their job to figure out if things cause cancer. If you want to know if your microwave is going to give you cancer, go to their website. The answer is probably not. If you want to know if asbestos gives you cancer, go to their website. If you want to know whether the chemicals in the bottles under your kitchen sink give people cancer, ask the IARC. They look at the evidence on thousands and thousands of common substances. And back in 2015, they graded processed meat, bacon, sausages, and salami as group one carcinogens known to cause cancer in humans. The cancer they were talking about was bowel cancer. They grouped red meat, so bacon and sausages, as group two carcinogens known to cause or suspected of highly likely of causing bowel cancer in humans. And here in the UK, where I live and work, we can see this in the epidemi we can see this in the epidemiological data. The UK Biobank, 175,000 adults followed up for years. Red and processed meat in particular are independent risk factors for developing colorectal cancer and probably cause eight and a half thousand cases of bowel cancer right here in the UK every year, which is a substantial chunk of the 42,000 cases that we see just eating these meats. I showed you my one apple a day keeps the oncologist away. I'm still waiting as a gastroenterologist for these warning stickers to appear on packets of bacon. And I'll allow you to fill in that sentence yourself. One strip of bacon a day, dot, dot, dot. Again, this shouldn't surprise us. Back in 1983, we saw data out of, the, out of Greece. And for me, look, as a gastroenterologist looking at this, I would think that this was Greek gastroenterologists who'd seen the traditional high fruit, high vegetable, low meat diet replaced by a high meat, low vegetable diet as Greece modernized. And they were wondering where the heck is all this bowel cancer coming from? And they showed that people who were eating this new standard American diet rather than a traditional Greek Mediterranean diet increased their risk of bowel cancer or were more, more likely to be diagnosed with bowel cancer by a factor of eight. And data from the US, the Nurses Health Study, 89,000 nurses predominantly followed for six years, showing that high consumers of red meat increased their risk of bowel cancer by a factor of 250%. So we're gonna move away from Florida a little bit, but staying in the US, Loma Linda, the US Blue Zone. You may have heard of this before. I'm sure Kim Williams and Dr. Essel Snow have spoken about this community, a diverse religious community of Seventh-day Adventists who are the healthiest people in the United States. They are some of the healthiest people on the planet in the country that invented the standard American diet. So the males are so healthy, they live 11 years longer than the US average, females living nine years longer than the US average. And the Adventists put a great emphasis on physical activity, healthy living, community, and faith. There is Dr. Ellsworth Wareham jumping into the pool in his second century. Dr. Wareham was a cardiothoracic surgeon who retired from his practice age 95 to travel the world. He then traveled the world, returned home, and passed away surrounded by family after a short illness at the age of 104. The lady pictured here, um, whose name escapes him, I'm afraid, is in her second century. She's over the age of 100. And her life was transformed at the age of 100 and something when she found purpose by volunteering to work at the old folks' home, handing out snacks and teas to the old folks. These people are healthy. They have 35% fewer digestive cancers, 47% less stroke, 65% less 
type 2 diabetes? What are they eating well? For religious reasons, the Adventists eat a very plant-forward diet. They Half of them are vegetarian. One in 12 don't eat any animal products at all. And even the Adventists who do consume meat consume very little. Their diet is 95% plant-based. What happens to their colon cancer risk? Well, among the Seventh-day Adventists in California, meat consumption is low, much lower than the US average. And their rates of colon cancer are 30% lower than the US average. I already said that Adventists don't eat very much meat, but among the Adventists who don't consume meat at all, their risk of bowel cancer was even lower, 36% 36 lower than the US average because they're eating even less meat, no meat in fact, more fiber, more legumes, more soybeans. And I often show this picture to capture a traditional whole food plant-based Seventh-day Adventist approach to food. Whole grains, legumes, plants, lots of color, lots of phytonutrients, lots of different fibers, healthy food, nutrient-dense food, not calorie-dense food. This is, a this is a traditional British meal, which I show here in the UK all the time. Dishes like this served up and down the country every single day. Everything on this plate, as far as I can tell, is designed for poor digestive health and to increase your risk of bowel cancer, where we consume 25 kilos of processed meat per person per year. Um, the fruits and vegetables are in bottles with sugar and vinegar. And the, there are no whole grains. There's some white bread over here. But just in case it might be good for you, there's a big slathering of animal fat down across, a big slabs of butter. And of course, here's a traditional American meal, completely different now to the traditional Adventist meal that I showed you a moment ago. Um, very common in many ways with the traditional British meal I just showed you a moment ago. Processed carbohydrates, sugar, meat, fat, nothing that's going to help reduce your risk. Of course, McDonald's proudly declaring that they feed this stuff to 69 million people every single day. But it's not just about bowel cancer. In fact, this study was published here in the UK just um, in the last year. Half a million people followed for almost nine years. And what they found, they weren't looking at cancer here, they were just looking at gut health in general. And for every 50 grams of red meat that people eat per day, they significantly increase their risk of getting conditions like diverticular disease, gallbladder disease, precancerous bowel polyps, that's red meat. For every 20 grams of processed meat, that's for every strip of bacon or piece of salami they ate every day, again, substantially increasing the risk of precancerous bowel polyps and diverticular disease. And poultry, chicken. So just 30 grams, one ounce of chicken per day or per 30 grams of chicken per day, because people who do eat chicken tend to eat uh, portions that are larger than 30 grams. But for every 30 grams, every ounce, we see substantial and significant increases in gallbladder disease, um, diverticular disease, gastritis, gastric ulcer, stomach ulcer, gastroesophageal reflux disease. So why is meat so bad for gut health? Well, there's lots of reasons. It's a lot to do with the substances that are in meat that you don't get in plants. So as we know, meat, particularly red meat, uh, uh, contains heme irons. So this is animal iron. It's the same iron that pumps through our, our blood vessels. We get it from other animals too. It's directly carcinogenic to the lining of the bowel. When you take a piece of meat and put a lot of heat on it, you take biologically active chemicals and you do a science experiment. And now you make new biologically active chemicals called heterocyclic amines and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which guess what? Are, are carcinogenic. They, they promote negative effects in the lining of the gut. And also we get the nitrates that naturally occur in red and processed meats and the nitrites that are added to processed meat to keep it nice and pink on the shelf. So it looks nice and pink when you buy it off the supermarket shelf are known to induce inflammation, DNA damage and precancerous changes in the lining of the gut, which promote the formation of cancer cells. But let's talk a little bit about one of my favorite topics, the human gut microbiome. As you're sitting here listening to this, whether you're in the library, in the other hall, or at home, or on your treadmill, like uh, Michelle there, you are not alone. You have got 100 trillion microbes within your digestive tract, mostly in your large bowel. 
bacteria, viruses, yeasts, and archaea, as many cells as the rest of your human body, and more than 150 times more genetic material than the rest of your human body. As an individual, your gut microbiome probably started the moment you were born with that first breath of fresh air, the first sip of, of breast milk. In fact, our breast milk, our mother's breast milk contains prebiotics to help grow the gut microbiome. They're not even digested by the baby. They're just there to feed the bugs. The microbiome helps us to digest our first meal. It's crucial to the development of a healthy uh, GI tract, immune system and body, and has been in adults remains and has been described as a control center for human biology. These microbes reside mostly in our colon, and we're talking about colon cancer today. So do they have a role in colon cancer prevention or promotion? Now they do, I mean, this is a slightly technical diagram here, but here on the very left, we have the normal lining of the colon. It's like these nice little healthy cells just lined up like little soldiers. And the progress towards a cancer takes years. Uh, in the next cartoon, you see excess growth or hyperproliferation. Then we get dysplasia, which causes an adenoma or polyp. And then the changes continue. You get a cancer. I showed you a little photograph, a little pink cancer earlier. This takes years. This is an adenocarcinoma. But of course, the important point here is that at every step of the way, these little squiggly microbes here of the gut microbiome are in intimate relation to these cells. So it's no surprise that they play a role. The role that the gut microbiome plays in carcinogenesis is kind of given away by the title of this paper that was published in Protein Cell Metabolism in 2018, The Association of Diet, Gut Microbiome, and Colorectal Cancer, What We Eat May Imply What We Get, because the food that we choose to eat on a daily basis helps to determine the structure and function of our gut microbiome, and the gut microbes aren't inert, they are making chemicals all the time. Time. We call them postbiotics. They directly affect our health. That is what, why the gut microbiome has been described as a control center for, gut micro, for human biology. And when you eat a meal that contains things like meat and processed meat and animal fat, as I've shown in the little photograph there, you are grabbing the dials on that control center for human biology, and you're dialing it in a negative, harmful way because you are feeding microbes that will produce carcinogenic secondary bile acids, pro-inflammatory hydrogen sulfide gas, and isn't very good at producing beneficial substances like short chain fatty acids. So this gut microbiome promotes inflammatory and carcinogenic effects. In short, you are building a gut microbiome that is conducive to chronic inflammation and cancer. But then the next day, so you've just been to this talk, you decide to eat some different food. And now you're eating a meal that looks like the Adventist bowl earlier, whole grains, vegetables, fruits, fiber. You are now feeding a different family of gut microbes. So you're grabbing the controls on that control center for human biology and you're dialing it into a beneficial mode because now you're feeding microbes that generate beneficial short chain fatty acids and vitamins and antioxidants and the secondary bile acids and the harmful hydrogen sulfide gas that we had with the other meal, those things start to tail right off. So you now have a gut microbiome that promotes anti-inflammatory and anti-carcinogenic effects. In short, you have built a gut microbiome that is not conducive to chronic inflammation and is not conducive to cancer. A couple of years ago, uh, there these two huge papers appeared in the medical literature. So we can do a lot with gut microbiome research now. And these researchers visited multiple different countries with different food cultures, different diets, different habits. And they sampled the gut microbiomes of individuals who'd been diagnosed with bowel cancer and people who didn't. And whatever country, whatever food culture, they saw the same thing. Because by measuring your gut microbiome, it's like it's kind of like doing a food diary lie detector test. Because you might tell me that you eat X, Y, or Z, but your gut microbiome will really tell me. Because we can measure which microbes you've been feeding. And they found that individuals who were diagnosed with bowel cancer in all of these different countries had a gut microbiome that was substantially enriched with the microbes that thrive on meat and fat with a higher ability to produce 
harmful postbiotic substances and fewer of the bacteria that metabolize fruits, vegetables, and starches. So the question is, when you hear all of that, do people who eat a plant-based diet have a healthier gut microbiome? The answer is yes, definitively. We've seen this time and time again in medical research. People who eat a whole food plant-based diet or plant-based diet make more beneficial short-chain fatty acids, which is good because they protect the intestinal barrier, regulate our immune system, help to control our appetite. Their microbiome is better at producing butyrate, which actually takes out precancerous cells in the lining of the colon. And their gut microbiome is, is just really bad at making secondary bile acids, which is good because secondary bile acids are pro-inflammatory and pro-carcinogenic. The plant-based gut microbiome also loses the ability to metabolize carnithine, which is a substance in red meat, and choline, a substance in eggs, to produce TMA, which your body turns into TMAO. This is good because individuals with elevated TMAO levels are three and a half times more likely to develop bowel cancer. And we even know that patients who've got newly diagnosed bowel cancer who have elevated TMAO levels do less well. They have shorter disease-free survival. And before I move on from that, this, this isn't controversial science. In fact, a few years ago, there was a paper published where they took individuals with um, metabolic syndrome, high blood pressure, obesity, type 2 diabetes, diabetes, and hypercholesterolemia. And these researchers, recognizing how important the gut microbiome is, decided that they would try and make these people healthier, not by changing their diet and lifestyle, but by changing their gut microbiome. And they went out to find the healthiest gut microbiomes they could find, and they sought out healthy vegans to give the poop transplants that were turned into gut microbiome transplants. It worked a little bit. The paper talked about how the transplant gave the volunteers a vegan-like gut microbiome, but the effect was temporary because they didn't give them shopping lessons and cooking lessons or cookbooks. They just put a, a feeding tube through their nose and down into their jejunum and ran vegan poop in there. I don't know about you, but I would rather take the kitchen approach. <laughs> this is old news. Back in 1973, the pioneering doctor and researcher, um, Dr. Dennis Burkett, published on the low rates of diseases, including bowel cancer and diverticular disease in developing countries in rural Africa, Dr. Burkett. He was known as Dr. Fiber uh, back in the 70s and 80s. And we've known for years that if you take someone from a country that has low rates of bowel cancer and they move to a country that has high rates of bowel cancer, within one or two generations, they and their children as adults will have the same high risk of developing colon cancer as everybody else in the country they moved to. So in this paper, for example, they looked at people coming from Japan, where there's hardly any bowel cancer, who moved to Hawaii, where the there's plenty of bowel cancer. And within two generations, they had the same risk profile as everybody else living in Hawaii. So why is that? I mean, there's a lot of changes that happen when you move from a low income country to an industrialized country. It could be cigarette, alcohol, chemicals, infections, antibiotics, or something in the environment we don't even know about. But what about food? Because that's what we're really here to talk about, right? Food. This paper was published a few years ago, 2015, fat, fiber, and cancer risk in African-Americans and rural Africans. And what Dr. O'Keefe and his team in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania did was they recruited 20 healthy African-American adults who have a one in 15 lifetime risk of bowel cancer. And they recruited 20 healthy Africans living in rural Africa in KwaZulu, South Africa, where bowel cancer is almost unheard of. And so they've got two populations separated by geography and history and they decided to assess their bowel cancer risk. Everybody did a colonoscopy and everybody did a gut microbiome analysis. And what they found was that 45% of the Americans already had precancerous bowel polyps. They didn't find one precancerous bowel polyp in the Africans, not one. And when they looked at how much the mucosa, the lining of the bowel was proliferating, it was high proliferation in the Americans, low in the Africans. And on their gut microbiome analysis across the board, 
the Americans had a high colorectal cancer risk profile. And the rural Africans across the board had a low risk profile. So completely different risk profiles. They then looked at the food they were eating. The Americans, sausage and pancakes, spaghetti and meatballs, hot dogs, beans, roast beef and mashed potato. And the rural African kitchen shown in the photograph is very basic. Spinach, red pepper, onions, corn fritters, mango, kale, African potato salad, very basic food. And what they did next was a food swap. They just got the Americans to eat like rural Africans and got the rural Africans to tuck into sausages and pancakes, spaghetti and meatballs, roast beef and mashed potato. So now the Americans were getting 70% of their calories from starchy carbohydrates and they were getting 55 grams of fiber per day, which is about three times the US average. And now the rural Africans were getting 12 grams of fiber per day. And they were getting 52% of the calories from fat and 27% of the calories from protein. They're eating a standard American diet. They just did this for two weeks, folks. And in two weeks, they repeated the analysis. All these volunteers, God bless them, the things that people do for science, they all had another colonoscopy and they all had another gut microbial analysis. And in just two weeks, the risk profiles had completely flipped. So now the, the Americans had a very low risk profile for developing bowel cancer. And now the Africans on that day had a high colorectal cancer risk profile. And this is a very complicated paper to read. It demonstrated that within two weeks, you can generate changes in the gut microbiome. You can change the postbiotics made by your gut microbiome from harmful to beneficial. And you can measure the effect on the human body because the mucosal proliferation rates in the lining of the bowel went down. And just remember, the administration of this intervention was given in the kitchen, not in the lab, not at the hospital. Even for individuals who are living with a diagnosis of bowel cancer, a healthy diet and lifestyle remains important. The American Cancer Society have guidelines for individuals living with cancer. They ask cancer survivors to engage in physical activity, avoid alcohol and cigarettes, and to avoid red and processed meat. They also ask them to eat what they call a plant-rich diet. They talk about eating the rainbow, lots of different fruits and vegetables and leafy greens, peppers and everything, all these different colors. They looked at data for 900 people diagnosed with stage three colon cancer. So this was 900 people with a very similar diagnosis. And what they found among the people who didn't adhere to their guidelines for healthy diet and lifestyle during cancer survivorship, after five years, the survival rate was only 65%, which is exactly what you'd expect, actually. This is the textbook survival rate for a stage three bowel cancer. But the individuals who got on board the diet and lifestyle program and were highly adherent had a five-year survival of 81%. If this was a new chemotherapy drug, it would be a blockbuster. And this paper published here in Europe, um, in the Netherlands, uh, showing that people diagnosed with stage one, two, or three bowel cancer after treatment who had a higher fiber intake, so eight more plants, had better quality of life, better physical functioning, less fatigue, improved ability to perform daily activities without any worsening in their tummy symptoms. People are often reluctant to recommend a healthy high fiber diet to people undergoing bowel cancer treatment in case it causes tummy problems for them, but it doesn't, but it does seem to benefit their quality of life. So coming right back to where we started, Every person in this picture representing 3,000 people in the United States will be diagnosed with bowel cancer in the coming 12 months. What should we tell them, their friends and relatives? Well, the majority of cases of bowel cancer are preventable through a healthy diet and lifestyle. Only 5 to 10% of cases are due to hereditary syndromes like um, Lynch syndrome, HNPCC, FAP. 90 to 95% of cases of colon cancer are sporadic they're not completely determined by our genetics. It's about genetic susceptibility and our environment that provokes the cancer. So basic stuff first, don't smoke, minimize or avoid alcohol. I showed you earlier, even moderate alcohol consumption increases the risk. 
When it comes to food, minimize or eliminate meat, particularly red and processed meat, while you maximize fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. Eat foods made from soya beans, which are particularly beneficial in reducing the risk. Eat calcium-rich, fiber-rich foods. Low risk is not no risk. If you have new symptoms in your tummy or in the bathroom, as we spoke about early on, talk to your doctor, get checked. And prevention and early detection, detection are incredibly important. And if you are lucky enough to have access to a bowel cancer screening program, please take part. In the United States, we now start screening for bowel cancer aged 45. Soon after Chadwick Boseman passed away, people looked at the evidence and the changing demographics of this disease and the, and the age was lowered to 45. Here in the UK, we have been screening from the age of 60, but we are now moving to 55. And I think we'll probably move to 50 after that. When it comes to food, a whole food plant-based diet ticks all the right boxes. It's never too early. It's never too late to make the change. And when you make the switch to a healthy whole food plant-based diet, you'll be eating a diet that's completely compliant with the Eat Lancet Planetary Health Plate, designed by a hand-picked panel of 38 independent experts around the world in 2019. They predicted if we could get everybody to eat like this where tiny amounts of animal products are regarded as optional. If we could all eat like Seventh-day Adventists, it would prevent 12 million unnecessary deaths per year. It would keep hundreds of millions of people out of the chemotherapy suite, out of the coronary bypass theater, out of the angiography suite. This sort of eating is completely compatible with the UK's dietary guidelines, which are actually a little bit out of date now. They're getting on for eight years old. They need to be updated, but completely in keeping with those guidelines where very small amounts of animal products are included, uh, but are always regarded as optional. The guidelines, even in 2016, telling people to eat more beans and pulses as their preferred sources of protein. Um, here are the Danish dietary guidelines published uh, just before Christmas. Eat plant rich, varied, and not too much. Don't you love that? Simple phrasing from the Netherlands. Um, you can see there's no meat section on there. There's no dairy section on there. The Canadian Eat Well Plate published in 2019, which was really interesting about the Canadian dietary guidelines, was that they didn't have any industries lobby them. So they didn't speak to any scientists from the dairy industry or any food producers from the meat industry. They just looked at the evidence and their healthy guidelines look a lot like the um, the uh, Eat Lancet plate. Again, there's no meat section. There's no dairy section. Eat vegetables, fruit, whole grains. If you're thirsty, drink water. And when you're choosing your high protein foods, they recommend choosing plant-based protein foods first. A little bit different to the US dietary guidelines, uh, the US dietary guidelines for Americans published in 2021. Well, they've made progress. They've got a protein section, not a meat section. But in, you know, uh, in uh, uh, contrast to other countries, the new dietary guidelines don't have dairy as the drink of choice anymore. Most dietary guidelines now recommend water as the drink of choice. And I suspect this has a lot to do with the fact that the U.S. dietary guidelines for Americans are commissioned, funded and written by the um, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, which has as its first stated goal to reduce barriers uh, to profitability for the ranchers and dairy farmers of the United States. This healthy whole food plant-based diet that I'm endorsing to reduce your risk of colon cancer is endorsed as a beneficial way to eat by the British Dietetic Association, the American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the Canadian Health Eating Guidelines, the American Cancer Society, the WHO, and the American Academy of Lifestyle Medicine, among numerous other um, organizations. At my clinic, every single patient who has a colonoscopy is given this information. How can I reduce my risk of colon polyps and colon cancer? If you're taking part in bowel cancer screening, you're already highly motivated. You should be given this information so you can look it up, you can <coughs> evaluate it and make changes yourself. And we even saw a paper just published about two weeks ago here in the UK showing that UK vegetarians and vegans are up to 20% less likely to be diagnosed with any cancer, up to 46% less likely to be diagnosed with prostate cancer, up to 32% less likely to be diagnosed with postmenopausal breast cancer, and that in the United Kingdom, low meat eaters are 14% less likely to be diagnosed with bowel cancer. I always say 
In the UK, there aren't any blue zones. The UK dietary intakes are terrible. We have the worst health statistics in Europe. Even the people in the UK who don't eat very much meat um, also don't eat very much um, fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes. We could do a lot better than this. There are so many resources out there that we can point our patients. There's so many to, there's so many resources for you guys. You've got all these crazy documentaries on YouTube and Netflix. Netflix. You've got websites you can go to for hundreds of millions of healthy recipes. Um, thanks very much, Debbie, for mentioning my book, which is there, another nice resource, which is in your local library. I've been here today representing myself, but also as an ambassador for Plant-Based Health Professionals UK. We are a UK-based uh, not-for-profit who aim to educate patients, policymakers, and members of the public on the benefits of a whole food plant-based diet. And if you would like to take part in our completely free 21 day challenge where you'll be given recipes and meal plans and a zoom session every two weeks with a registered dietitian you can just point your phone camera at that box right now and it'll bring you to our website maybe debbie you can leave that i mean that is being recorded anyway right but you, you i'll leave it up at the end of the presentation that's me and at the start of this presentation, I asked you to remember one slide. Standard Western diet sets us up for standard Western diseases. Here's the second thing you need to remember from today. The evidence overwhelmingly favors a whole food plant-based diet is the optimal choice for human health and longevity. The more plant-based, the better. That's it. Thanks, Debbie. Um, I guess we'll take some questions. Um, so, Dr. Desmond, that was an excellent presentation, and it was hard to focus on the presentation with the chat box going crazy. I wanted oh, to good. mention um, to everybody that this presentation will be on the Chat and Chew website. It will also be on the Pope Wellness Professionals website next week. So, um, if you didn't catch anything, there was so much fabulous information. I just thank you, but um, it will need be. You remember those two slides, Debbie. Just the, okay. so okay. yeah, everything in between was just you know interesting. Yeah, but, you know, for all of those people who eat meat, it's very important. Um, also, your book is available on Amazon, and um, Linda did post that website and the direct link to the book. So a couple of questions here. Uh, for the people who are starting a new diet and they... Um, you know, sometimes there are downsides. They have the gas and the flatulence. Uh, so is there a downsize to gas X or Beano for the gas issue? No, I often recommend those, actually. So the reason that, that beans and legumes can provoke bloating and abdominal distension is because they're so healthy. So they, they really do feed the gut microbiome and the way the gut microbiome makes the beneficial substances is by saccharolytic fermentation, breaking down the starches and turning them into healthy postbiotics like short chain fatty acids. That process, fermentation, causes bubbles and gas and a little bit of bloating. So if you haven't been eating like this before, for some people, when they make the change, they will get some gas and bloating. So those 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 uh, enzyme supplements um, actually break down the ferment, some of the fermentable carbohydrates, making them digestible to your human digestive tract. So you don't get so much of the gas, etc. But with time, as your gut microbes and your digestive system adjust to this new healthy way of eating, you shouldn't need to use those long term. Another thing you can do is just do it low and slow. You know, you don't have to jump straight into all good plant based today. Um, you can start with breakfast tomorrow do breakfast for a few weeks maybe learn three or four nice plant-based breakfasts that you can have on rotation then move on to lunch then move on to dinner then start snacking on fruits uh, in between and give yourself five or six weeks to make the change okay another question i had was um for those people who feel it's important to have a cheat day you know, you were really giving some great information and you said within two weeks, you know, your gut microbiome is really doing great. I mean, it's fabulous. So what happens when you throw a cheat day in there? You know, you're going fabulous, but all of a sudden you backslide. So what can you tell these people? Well, I think those, those little cheat days um, can be helpful. 
um, because they can be, when you're making any healthy change, uh, whether that's quitting cigarettes, quitting alcohol, or eating a whole food plant-based diet, um, those cheat days can be very useful, right? Because you can reflect on how you feel the next day. And you can reflect on what impact that that quarter pounder with cheese had on you in terms of your digestive health, uh, et cetera. So that can be really useful, um, number one. Number two, don't beat yourself up. I mean, at the end of the day, we're all hoping for a longer, healthier, and happier life. Isn't that right? So, you know, if we are getting too stressed out about food and then that we get stressed out and that can negatively affect our digestive health as well, causing nausea and bloating and constipation and driving us to unhealthier food choices. So I would say, Debbie, don't be too hard on yourself is, 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 is my main thing. And look, if you view that quarter pound with cheese as a slip up on one day, then just take the lessons and move forward. We have one uh, coming up for you right now, but can you just quickly explain what is it about GERD that, that's related to da diet? What do we need to know about that? Yeah, so gastroesophageal reflux <laughs> disease. So the, the main things for me that provoke gastroesophageal reflux disease are a high fat diet. So, you know, things like ice cream and yogurt and meat and eggs, because when you consume a high fat food, it reduces the speed of the conveyor belt. If you think of the food moving through your system, like being at the conveyor belt at the supermarket checkout, when you have high fat foods, the conveyor belt slows right down, giving more opportunity for food to reflux and regurgitate into your lower esophagus. So that's important. Number two, eating high fiber foods and foods that are high in phytonutrients that has the opposite effect, helping to promote gastric emptying and keeps everything moving south beyond the stomach, way down into the bowel and everything. Um, we know that people with a healthy whole food plant-based diet with a high fiber approach to food might open their bowels or poop three or four times per day. That's a good thing. That's a healthy thing. And it keeps it, that whole conveyor belt, that supermarket conveyor belt that I described runs in one it's like a continuous movement isn't it so if we can keep everything moving south we get less gastroesophageal reflux disease dr desmond a question came up from the chat box actually a couple of them um dgl and tums are they okay as far as dealing with upset yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm not against using medication. You know, I'm, I'm a board certified uh, gastroenterologist and um, a, a general physician. So I have a prescription pad. But of course, I will always bring diet and lifestyle advice, equal billing with my prescription pad. And those medications can be useful for as and when use. They just neutralize um, the acid in your stomach. But I guess because our uh, 21st century diets and lifestyles are so busy and so adverse to good gut health, it's really, really, really common to have indigestion, a bit of bloating, a bit of acid reflux. In fact, antacid medications like Tums and also things like H2 receptor antagonists and proton pump inhibitors are the one of the most commonly prescribed medications in the entire planet, can you imagine? That are, uh, whereas healthy digestion has served our ancestors for hundreds of thousands of years. But now in the 21st century, we can't even enjoy our food. Um, and we need to take medications to put a lid on the acid suppression in our stomach just to try and tamp down some of those symptoms. So I guess what I'm trying to say here uh, briefly is that yes, things like that are fine to use on an as needed basis, but you should also be really focusing on the other aspects like a healthy, high fiber diet, lower fat diet, getting adequate sleep, getting a little bit of movement, getting a little bit of exercise, avoiding unnecessary medications, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So they're fine to use, um, but for me, all those other things are just as important. One, one other question that came up, what is the best way to analyze a healthy microbiome? Is You mentioned the bowel cancer screening test. Is there, what would you recommend if you're going in for your checkup and you want to know if you have a healthy microbiome? Yeah, so the honest answer to that is that we don't have great studies or great analyses yet.
Um, I was just saying that there are a lot of companies that offer gut microbiome testing. You can pay them about $300 send them a poop sample and they'll tell you all these things about your gut microbiome and they'll tell you about the different bacteria and yeasts and viruses that are in your gut microbiome. But it's not that useful because really what we want is the functional tests and those are appearing now. This is an exciting time because I think those assays will be commercially available to people in the next two or three years and they will be able to tell you, are you making enough short chain fatty acids? Are you producing harmful postbiotics? Are you producing short chain fatty acids or are you producing secondary bile acids? Right now, I honestly don't think we're there yet. These things are very useful in a research um, setting, but there are some exciting companies like Zoe in the UK who are also available in the US who are doing some really interesting stuff. But I suppose, Linda, the important point here is that even though that gut microbiome analysis and those poop tests I'm describing are getting more and more and more interesting, for 99.99% of people, they're completely irrelevant because they won't have access to them. So for you know, the, the, those microbiome tests aren't going to solve the world's problems. They're not going to solve the US's incredibly high rates of colorectal cancer. What is going to do that is healthy diet and lifestyle changes. Thank you. Okay, Brandy wants to know if these, the information and the tips that you're offering would be helpful for reversing illness such as mild chronic gastritis. Well, absolutely. Uh, gastritis is often caused uh, by long-term medication use. So non steroidal anti-inflammatories like aspirin, for example, uh, ibuprofen, and other non steroidal anti inflammatories, alcohol use, unhealthy dietary intakes. And if you are someone who's been diagnosed with gastritis, it's always worth asking your GI or your primary care physician if you've been checked for a bacteria in your microbiome, in your stomach microbiome, called Helicobacter pylori. Okay, we have a question here. Uh, Dr. Hello. You mentioned earlier that milk was uh, could aid, you know, the consumption of milk could aid in um, a decent microbiome, but not yogurt. Yogurt is kind of touted for being, you know, probiotic and having all these good biotic, you know, like, um, bacteria in them. But so why would they be beneficial beneficial to your microbiome? Yeah. So uh, fermented foods. Um, do seem to offer unique benefits to the gut microbiome. There's a nice paper published um, earlier this year um, where they randomized individuals to a high fermented food diet or a high fiber, high fruit and vegetable diet. Everybody's gut microbiome got healthier. There was a lot of benefits, but there were some unique benefits in each group that the other group didn't experience. So that suggests to us that fermented foods may bring additional benefits to the gut microbiome that you don't just get by eating lots of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds. However, these things are not mutually exclusive. You don't have to choose team fiber or team fermented because within that study, many of the fermented foods that they used were plant-based uh, fermented vegetables, sauerkraut, even kombucha. Although it was a very, it wasn't like a super sweet kombucha like you might buy at the store. It was a kind of, a, you know, a tea kombucha. So not a very, very sweet kombucha. The data that I showed you tells us that yogurt consumption does not reduce your risk of bowel cancer. It just doesn't. So it doesn't. So people who are promoting uh, yogurt consumption to help reduce your risk of bowel cancer need to do a little bit more work in order to convince me that it's helpful. I also showed you uh, the other reasons why I don't recommend increasing one's intake of dairy for any putative health benefits, uh, particularly reducing colorectal cancer risk because of the associations with other cancers, including more common cancers, such as prostate cancer in men and breast cancer in females. Thank you. I think they're going to ask Okay, I have so, another question. Sure. Um, sure. In regards to adding fiber to your diet, so I'm a vegetarian and I do eat a lot of vegetables, but when it comes to like beans and grains, I notice that um, I just don't have enough liquid in my diet to pass those, but it seems like I'm like oversaturating myself. So I can't really say that just add more water is going to help. What can help? And then the second question is, does bio salts, taking bio salts help? 
Yeah, so number one, um, if you're already vegetarian and you eat a ton of fruits and vegetables and, and, and all those good things, then you're probably doing fine. I mean, you don't, you know, you may, you're probably already consuming 40 or 50 grams of fiber per day. So I would imagine that you're already in a good place there. That, that's the first thing I would say. Um, the second thing I would say is that, yes, for some people, if they really try and go nuts with fiber and have 60, 70 or 80 grams of fiber per day, given that their digestive system hasn't seen anything like this for the preceding 30, 40, 50 or 60 years, and maybe their family hasn't seen anything like this for two or three generations, um, it may be difficult for them to handle such high levels of fiber as we might see, for example, in the rural African populations that I showed in one of the studies earlier. So I think aiming to eat as much fiber as you are comfortable with is a great approach. Um, Dr. Desmond, for a patient who has Crohn's and an ostomy, how do you recommend fiber intake? Yeah, How would well, you? I have lots. I have lots of patients with Crohn's and an ostomy, and I, in, in my experience, it's unpredictable. I have had patients with Crohn's and an ostomy who I can't believe how much fiber they're eating. They're probably eating more fiber than I eat and they're absolutely fine. The issue with high fiber intake with an ostomy is that people with an ostomy don't have all of their large bowel and continuity. So when you digest food, whatever kind of food, it draws a lot of water into your digestive system. In the normal course of events, all that water would get delivered to your colon, which really is really good at reabsorbing water so you don't get dehydrated. But if you have an ostomy, you can lose a lot of liquid and lose a lot of water into the stoma. Now, the benefits of a healthy diet go way beyond the gut microbiome benefits, which is what I focused on today. Because by eating a healthy whole food plant-based diet, you're getting more vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, more folate, more phytonutrients. You're overall eating a much healthier diet. So my patients with stomas, some of them jump right in genuinely. But I, I would genuinely recommend, I would generally recommend that my patients with stoma, just like I said to the last lady who asked the question from the library, just to go low and slow, maybe start with breakfast, then move on to lunch, then move on to their evening meal, and to gradually increase and see what they tolerate. I guess, Debbie, when you're dealing with someone who's had major surgery on their digestive tract like this, you're really getting into a specialist area. And often these patients, no matter what they eat, depending on which part of the digestive tract has been removed, they may not be able to absorb all their nutrients. And often in these cases, they may need to be on multivitamins, they may need to be on B12, and it's really something they should be working with the registered dietitian on an individual basis. Awesome. Linda, do you have the next question? Yes, um, there is a person in the chat box is asking about, she, she was on GERD, she, she has GERD and she's on PPIs for 10 years. And now she has developed osteoporosis and she's no longer doing the PPIs and she's doing Pepsid and Pepsid AC. Can you slow down the osteoporosis without medication? Can you get enough calcium is her question. Um, it takes a long time to develop osteoporosis. So if you have osteoporosis now, it's something that's developed over decades. That's the first thing. So if you've been diagnosed with osteoporosis, it's likely that your doctor will recommend you uh, vitamin D and calcium and maybe even medications called bisphosphonates in order to allow your bones to strengthen. The important thing here is that bone strength and bone density isn't just about food, right? It's also about weight bearing exercise. That's important. Excuse me, I should have said it's not just about calcium. It's not just about calcium. It's about weight bearing exercise, yoga, walking, light weights. These very actively help to improve our bone density. So these things need to be considered. Yoga, Tai Chi, whatever you feel able for is really, really important. Having enough vitamin D is really important for your bone health. We get vitamin D from the sunshine. We don't get so much sunshine here in the southwest of England. I believe you get plenty in Florida most of the year, but you need about 20 to 40 minutes of bright sunshine on your face, neck, and your arms in order to make enough vitamin D every single day, okay? But even with your lovely Florida sunshine, 
Most people aren't out in the sun for 20 to 40 minutes per day, right? They're in their car, they're in their office, they're in Zoom meetings like this, they're at the hospital. So really, we should all be supplementing with vitamin D year round, unless we're real outdoorsy people who live and work in the outdoors. So that's important, making sure you're getting enough sunlight or that you're taking a vitamin D supplement. If like me, you're in the hospital most days, exercise, vitamin D, healthy protein in your diet, magnesium, phosphate, calcium all of these things are more than available to you on a healthy whole food plant-based diet linda does that look like all of our questions there's one more here that i don't think we've addressed and this particular person is interested in knowing that if there's been a diagnosis of colon cancer are there studies that have been done with the patient eating a plant-based diet has a colonoscopy been done again to show the improvement? How do you measure improvement after the patient has been diagnosed? Well, as I showed earlier, there's been a study showing that people diagnosed with bowel cancer who engage in healthy diet and lifestyle practices at diagnosis have a longer survival rate, substantially longer. That's the first thing. There's also been the study published in the Netherlands showing that people who are living with a diagnosis of bowel cancer who eat more plants, which is a kind of a broad marker of a healthier dietary intake, have a better quality of life, better energy levels, and fewer symptoms on a day-to-day -day basis. We've even seen a paper published at the Microbiome 2022, which is a very nerdy scientific conference, showing that people who are on treatment for bowel cancer respond better to their chemotherapy if they are eating a high fiber diet. So there's so many reasons for somebody who's been diagnosed with bowel cancer to engage in a healthy diet and lifestyle. But of course, surgery, the chemotherapy, and all of these wonderful innovations that we have to treat these cancers are just as important. Okay. Uh, Debbie, I think we've gone past our time and we want to be respectful of Dr. Desmond's time. So you've got something to say to Dr. Desmond before he leaves us. Well, no, just thank you very, thank you very much. I just want to say thanks very much before I finish. You guys are wonderful. And thanks for your lovely questions. I really enjoyed it. Well, this has been great. And Dr. Desmond, we do have a very small thank you present coming. I'm going to share my screen and show you what it is. And it should be arriving at your hospital on month, on Tuesday. Oh, wow. But we know that you spend a lot of time in the kitchen. And this is a vegan apron. And these are things that people are always saying, no, I don't eat fish. Yes, I get enough protein. My B12 is fine. Thank you very much. It's not a diet. It's a lifestyle. What do I eat? Food. No, I don't want to eat meat. Yes, I am still a vegan. So that should be coming to you. Um, and it's coming via Amazon. Thank heavens for Amazon. Oh, thank um, you, Debbie. That, that's beautiful. I'll wear it with pride. Well, we truly, truly appreciate this. You have been absolutely fabulous. Your presentation was wonderful. And we are going to be sharing that with everyone. So thank you for being here. Oh, thank Thanks you so, so much. Have much. a great weekend. Yes. And Dr. Desmond, before you leave, we, since we had Dr. Williams last month, he says that there are two kinds of cardiologists. And there's those that have read the data and those that haven't. What is the way you have a take on that that fits your specialty? What is yours? Yeah, you know, you know, when I met Kim Williams for the first time, I said, hi, Kim, nice to meet you. There's two kinds of gastroenterologist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you can finish the rest of that sentence, but yeah, I agree with Kim. I agree with Kim. Yeah. Have a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, we're going to let him leave, and then we'll do one last, two last little pieces of business, and that is we'll talk about our next meeting. So I don't know if you can see me, but I'm Kathy, and we're going to tell you about what's going to be here in the library and on Zoom um, next April the 8th, and that is going to be Dr. Roseanne Oliveira, and you know it's so exciting that we're going to have her because 
Her history is very similar to one of our very first Zoom speakers. It was Skype then, Dr. Colin Campbell. She too started off trying to figure out how to give better protein dairy to the populations. And she was doing it through genetics in her research. And she read his book and she had the strength to change directions. And now she's talking about how can she help us get more plants to lose weight and stop yo-yo dieting. So join us on April the 8th, register on Eventbrite. And Linda, you're putting the Eventbrite link there in chat for our people that are there in Zoom. And we'll put it in our newsletter. And why don't you close it out for us, Linda? Okay. Um, the link for the April 8th meeting is in the chat box. Hey, uh, the other thing that I have is just to thank everybody, especially Dr. Desmond and the many, many people, the thanks to you for coming today. And we hope to see you on April the 8th. Thanks so much.